Right, welcome ladies and gents. I am joined today by none other than friend of the channel, William Eubank, the director of The Signal, Underwater, one of the paranormal activities, I can't remember. <laughs> next of Kin, yeah. That's the yeah. one, Next of Kin, I did watch that, yeah. I enjoyed that. And uh, the latest film, which we're going to be talking about today, uh, Land of Bad. How you doing? Not too bad. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, always, always good to touch base with you. So, it's good to have you back. Good, good to, to have you back. So, Land of Bad. Um, how how would you sell it to people? How would you describe this? Because I've been calling it an action film, and someone, a few people said, "Ah, oh, is it an action film?" So, how yeah, you, definitely, how kind of like a. Thr I, I mean. I think when people were reading the script, they were saying it's kind of like a throwback 90s action film. It's not, you know, the craziest. It's definitely no Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy or anything like that. It's it's more straightforward guys on a mission. Um, I always kind of said it's like kind of like where, you know, a guy gets behind enemy lines, loses his team. He's got nothing. And the only weapon he really has is his eyes in the sky with uh, a couple hellfire yeah. missiles on it and that's the guy on the ground is liam hemsworth and the guy the eye in the sky is russell crow playing eddie grim yeah. reaper <laughs> so uh yeah it's a real like mission gone wrong you know race for hmm. survival movie yeah and so essentially this is i mean yeah you're right like it is a, a a sort of 90s throwback i like that analogy 90s throwback um thriller action film and i i would i would encourage everyone to go watch it like i've already said uh in my review i had a very good time with this what was from from inception writing ideas what talk, tell me talk, talk me through how this whole film came honestly to the real reality is so i wrote this film with one of my writing partners on uh, my first like bigger ish movie the signal so that that wasn't my first movie but it was kind of my first real movie with a big crew and or a bigger crew it wasn't like being made in my parents backyard by myself that love is like right. an artsy small movie right signal Those we were working on that What's that? Loads of people really, loads of people really enjoy that film. Yeah, I mean, look, super proud of that film. It's just you know very different type of film. It's an artsy film, but but I think visually and you know it's one of those films you make when you're a young filmmaker and you love to ask questions, but you have no idea how to answer them. <laughs> so you're just like, this is basically like any college student, really. Um, but uh, yeah, so. The Signal, we were making this movie. I remember I was driving home from shooting all night and we'd been shooting Robert Longstreet in the scene with uh, Lawrence Fishburne where Fishburne like walks in and Robert Longstreet's this person who weird shit's happening to them because they've been abducted by aliens, but they don't know it and they've been so tested on that they're kind of crazy. And Robert Longstreet delivered such a wild performance. It was so crazy. That I remember thinking to myself, like, whoa, this is a weird movie. <laughs> this movie is so weird. My own and movie's I, weird. What's that? Like you're, you're, you're sat there thinking, my movie's weird. Yeah, like, wasn't expecting quite that performance where you just felt like, it felt very, like, David Lynchian. It felt like, like, Robert brought, you know, not only was he quirky, but he brought some real emotion to the scene that made it really strange like strongly weird where it was so weird that I remember thinking to myself like, Whoa, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure people are like going to gel with this movie. And you know, it's like, sometimes you just let the most the, that happen, you know, but then you're thinking to yourself like, wow, that really wasn't the movie I was sort of making. This is so quirky <laughs> that like, maybe I'll never work again. So Fridge and I were thinking David Frigerio, uh co-producer, co-writer on land of bad. So this is, 15 years ago or 14 years, whatever it was, 10 years ago, mm. um, we were thinking like, gosh, we need something more sort of mainstream-ish, something that's a little more digestible. We need a follow-up movie that people can like understand. And um, right. so at the time, Dr Reaper drones were kind of becoming more mainstream. People were hearing about them. We thought we should, you know, make a drone movie. And so we kind of cracked this idea and started writing it on the weekends while we were filming the signal. 
so it's from a long time ago um and then over the course of all the years after that it changed and you know we took mm. it from it was in the sand at the time they made the movie good kill so we were like ah they kind of done this film so we yeah, tabled yeah. it but we kept revisiting it um just because we liked the characters and we over time and as we met some people we realized like real jtacs and real drone pilots we kind of realized like the good kill version where it's about ptsd and being disassociated with the battlefield and all that we realized that's like not really the movie we're trying to make so we we finally mm -hmm. were inspired to sort of chase down what we were trying to do and all these years later finally made it okay wow so, yeah okay i wasn't expecting it to be uh, uh such a long gestation <laughs> yeah it's or, uh, it's been sitting on the really? shelf for years years yeah that's no, interesting so all right so then and how, so how, how how did this get made then who did you pitch it to what happened yeah talk, talk so now. um way yeah it was probably it was i guess it was around the time they were doing the movies the nice guys with russell crowe mm. and he was in town um doing uh press for the nice guys awesome movie and uh there was an opportunity to pitch him a movie that i had gotten back called world breaker that had been at warner brothers and then mm. it left warner brothers kind of went through a couple different renditions of different production companies and um there was an opportunity to pitch russell to play the main role in this sort of fantasy very like fantasy braveheart type crazy crazy project and uh they were like okay you need to go to the beverly hills hotel and you're gonna set up in a room all your art and he's gonna come in and you're gonna pitch him on like you know each piece of art and tell him this you know everything he's already read the script so he likes the script but you know you need to pitch him the movie and so yeah he came in and uh yeah i just kind of pitched him and it was such a cool pitch where he was so like into the art and you know we were mm. drinking like i think tea or something like <laughs> just having tea looking at like all this art and uh yeah he was so cool we kind of just hit it off and he invited me like bike riding later and i'm like okay. i'm thinking like man and he, he was like serious bike ride like he wanted to bike all over like beverly hills area and i was i, I didn't all i had was like a bmx bike so i was like yeah, it's like I don't think I can come biking because I just have this BMX bike, and uh, he was laughing. But we ended up hanging out later, or like a couple days later, and, and we'd hit it off. Unfortunately, World Breaker hit some other snags, and then I got the job underwater, and so it was put on hold, and uh, so we never did it. And years and years later, I, you know, had this. We were starting to push to make Land of Bad. And I figured, hey, why don't I just reach out to Russell and see if he'd be interested in playing Reaper? So I did. And Russell was like, well, I haven't talked to you in years. He's like, how's it going? It's good to talk to you. This is all through text. And mm -hmm. um, I was like, hey, I'd love to send you this script, you, you know, if you have time to check it out, to play the role of Reaper. And he was like, well, really busy these days. But I'll uh, <clears throat> tell you what, I'll, 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 I will look at it. He's like, tell me what it's about. So. I call him, but he doesn't like pick up. So I'm like, damn, now I have to like text him what it's about. <laughs> so I, I'm like, it's kind of like a loss of innocence story about a drone operator behind en enemy lines and has a little bit of a perspective on violence or at least sort of puts it out there. Like what is violent? You know, I kind of tried to explain it in like an artsy way to make it seem interesting, you know, and, and he laughed and he was like, he's like, all right, let me just send me the script. I'll get back to you in a couple of weeks. Um, and he actually text me the next day wow love the script tell you what if you can get this put together um i'm in so you just you if you guys can get it together let me know and so we got it together as soon as he said he was in we got together and then you know russell made the movie go from there really because yeah. as soon as we had russell then we went out to a couple different people went out to liam liam decided he he wanted to do it and uh from there we we could go and it became a foreign sales movie which for anyone who doesn't know, that is a very tricky way. It's not a tricky way. It's a way a lot of movies get made where they sell the foreign territories first. And then that with that money, you go make the film. 
Um, so I knew, you know, that's a tricky way to make a film because you really often, um, you don't have that much money to make the film. It's a lower budget version of the film. Mm. Uh, people get paid, you know, they get paid their rates. So the money doesn't go as far because there's no studio saying, Hey, this is a big film. It's going to be everywhere. Mm. You're going to be in everyone's living room. So, you know, on a big studio film that the studio can kind of like get, they'll pay people less because they'll say it's a bigger movie Back -end you know? deal type things. And yeah, they're like, we're making you a movie star. So we're going to pay you five bucks, you know, <laughs> a foreign sales movie. You're doing an independent film where, you know, the actors are taking a risk on you and, you know, mm. you don't, you it's not guaranteed what's going to happen. So most people get paid their rates and, and whatnot. So it can be tricky making a foreign sales movie. Um, and as a filmmaker, you really have to go into it thinking, okay, how do I, knowing the constraints, how can I build this shoot to, to, uh, still retain like value and, and how do I, you know, how do I maximize, even though I know I'm not going to have as much money to do explosions and that kind of thing. So. Mm. Okay. Nice. Nice. So. All right. Well, so you, right. So you got Russell Crowe. You got Liam Hemsworth. Who I've got to say, actually, like I'm not massively familiar with uh, Liam's work. But I really enjoyed him in this. And oh, thank I you. I sort of I characterized his 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 performance and his role as a very traditional. And you correct me if if this isn't how you wanted it to come across, or if I'm wrong. But I sort of perceived it as quite a you know, a sort of a hero's journey, you know, starts out meek, you know, a little bit wet behind the ears type type thing. And he, through, through the movie, through his trials and tribulations, does essentially turn into a bit of a badass. Yeah. But it's a much more believable film in that way. Because, you know, these... I, I, would, I would sort of characterize this film as like a mid-tier film, a mid-tier box office film, right? And that's not to denigrate the film. It's the no, same. no, no. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like, like it, it's it's not produced to be a blockbuster. It's yeah, it's a film. Yeah. It's a mid-tier film. Very and, in a weird way. Very lucky to be in theaters right now. You know. Well, well, this is yeah. I mean, you should go watch it in theaters if you can, guys. It it was it was an enjoyable film. I had a good time with it. Um, but it was you know the, these kind of these these mid-tier films, generally speaking, are normally only popularized with one certain actor or two actors and they're always in the same types of films and you know normally it's like a jason statham type right, right? and he right. plays the same character all the time he's always a badass from the start right the way through to the end and what i found refreshing about this as a mid-tier offering was that it was very carefully written like it was thoughtfully written he believably written he goes through a character arc it's not just this bombastic army man that's going in yeah i'm gonna you know gung-ho murder everyone it you know it adds so much more credibility to the film having it well written basically. yeah i appreciate that and and to liam's credit he really um what i love about liam is he's you know it's like obviously the hemsworths they're all guys guys right um you know, they love to, you know, smash heads and take names later. It's just like in their Australian jeans or something. Um, they basically, it feels like they own the West or the East Coast of Australia. <laughs> it's just like, uh, but, you know, Liam is so cool where he, he's very, uh, he's a very sensitive, thoughtful person. So it's like, you know, explaining to him, yeah, you have to play the rookie. You kind of have to play you know the the guy who's in over their head and under you know explaining that arc to him um you know he's fully on board and fully down to be a little more sensitive and and um like there were so many scenes where i was really impressed where he was like really kind of being playing it way more sensitive than i would have thought he would have done um mm -hmm. so it really opened that wide open the only thing where we disagreed for a second and then he got it was when we were going into the jungle, he was like, he's like, man, I just look like an idiot in this hat. You know, all the other guys get like cool hats and I got to wear this big helmet. And I'm like, dude, it's part of the plan. He's like, nah, but I, I 
if they're not wearing them, I'm, I would take mine off by now. And I'm like, trust me, I'm going to get your hat off. I just, it's like, we need it for these first few scenes because you look a little dopey in it, you know? Not that soldiers look dopey in helmets, but yeah, it's just like with the big head, like, and, you know, he's tall and lanky. And, like, we all knew that, yeah, you look a little bit more sort of like a kid in a big helmet. Yeah. And I was like, it's so key that we keep this on as long as we can. And then when the shit hits the fan, that's when you lose it, you know? And uh, so he finally was like, okay, okay. You know, because he got it. But he knew he looked a lot better without the helmet. But we specifically did that. It really helped that visual arc. I did the same thing a little bit with uh, Bretton Thwaites on the signal where, you know, Bretton looked like such a, like, you know, guy's guy that I was, like, really – trying to like make him look a little nerdier and uh, it was tricky i was like mm. trying to make you know nick and the signal be a little bit you know dorkier at the start and then yeah, yeah, yeah. heroic at the end it's always you're trying to figure out how do we visually pull this off so fortunately with liam it was big part was that helmet <laughs> yeah so, so all right so what well, so liam how how did he come around uh working on this project what was you know really was we uh i'd never spoken to him or anything we just sent it to his agent um and we'd also sent the script to luke hemsworth separately through their agents and um you know i don't know if they have ever spoke i never even asked them but luke had done a project with my little brother that my little brother had written so i knew kind of a little in there so we'd sent it to both of them and we were like they're not gonna reply because they're gonna be like Ah, we don't want to work together you know that's gonna be weird but they both did in the end and so it was kind of cool and liam had said the same thing he was like yeah i kind of like this it's a bit of a 90s you know action yeah. thing it's not like too complicated too complex but i think there could be something there you know and then when i spoke about like the whole kind of loss of innocence and the perspective on violence and the trying to like have a little bit of that going on in there without being too over the top mm. um yeah he was into it so nice. came on board yeah, yeah. and obviously helpful that russell is he's going to be with russell who i guess they they knew each other pretty well from a previous film so, mm. so that's cool what was uh what was it like working with russell russell crow then did a lot about that just love russell he's the best he i love him so much he he first off he's incredibly dedicated to his character so he was working on the Pope's Exorcist, and he started, like you know, that. what's that? I quite like that film. Yeah, that so he's like, he's sending me videos like, ah. He's like, well, I'm exhausted today. I got so many lines I got to learn, but I'm really loving this film. But here's, you know, he would always send me like, because he's he works hard. So he's looking ahead because he's finishing Pope's Exorcist in Ireland, and then he's coming straight to us. So he was really starting to look ahead oh, wow. at what's happening with his character and he was like, we really got to nail down some of these things. And I want to know everything about, you know, Eddie Grim Reaper. And he's not just like, I'm going to show up and we're going to say some lines. He mm -hmm. built Eddie Grim Reaper, literally the backstory of all the ex-wives. It's all his story. It's not mine. Uh, okay. That I'm is dying. him. And so like the, the Hawaiian shirt thing, that's like from MASH. I forgot what's his name's character in MASH, but he really mm -hmm. wanted to kind of, have this ornery like a little bit of a you know a little bit of a spicy grumpy sassy nature <laughs> so I, I you know developing that with him was was a true joy and you know there's obviously a lot of like changing lines like the morning of mm. where as he started to feel his character more and more he was like oh we gotta do it like this or we gotta do it like that and um yeah, spoiler. Uh, well, I won't say it because I don't want to spoil it for anyone. But I'll just say this: the very ending is his idea. That's that's Russell. Oh, I did okay. not say, "Let's do that." That was Russell. He's yeah. like, that was his idea, and I think it's one of the sweetest parts of the film. And I honestly mm. can't imagine the movie without it, because to me, it's so cathartic. It's so like so much has happened, and it, my initial 
ending would have been in that helicopter. That's how I was thinking. And there was a Fruit Loop yeah. handoff there that never made it into the film because it was too <laughs> crazy. It was like, where did those Fruit Loops come from? They were all battered and bloody. And we just couldn't watch it without it being too distracting. So we were like, we've got to cut this out. Uh, damn, that should go on the freaking digital edition. Though. Oh, my God. I have to put that. I have to make a call after this because they're making the special edition right now. We're going to do a commentary. And I need to put ah. that alternate Fruit Loop ending in. Oh, my God. It has to go in. Yeah. Okay. Anyways. Done. Sorry. <laughs> so that was Russell's idea to do that, which if you watch anyone watching the film, you'll just – there's a mm. – something at the end you'll see you'll understand but um russell is he's a real artist and he never is satisfied like he never sells it or he never is just like phoning it in he's he's 100 so committed to like every little detail that you'll you know you'll get a great take and you'll be like oh that's amazing let's move on i'd be like russell that's so good let's let's move on that's amazing he but he wouldn't even turn around he would just be like well Please, please, two more takes. I promise, fifteen percent better. I promise. <laughs> I'm like, okay, dude, that's amazing. But let's go. Let's do two more takes. And he would always like bring out some magic. But yeah, I don't know. He just he loved. He's full of so much life and knowledge, and like mm. just a joy to be around. Because he he's not ever trying to like. He just he knows so much about like theater and dancing he really is a renaissance man he's old that, school, isn't he? what's that he's oh 100 yeah and he just loves life you know like he has so many little details about like we we had a tequila one night his favorite tequila and he was like okay we're gonna put this ice cube in here and we're gonna wait seven minutes and he like sets his watch and he's like trust me this tequila seven minutes with an ice cube is the best tequila you'll ever have <laughs> and so you're like okay well, let's try it and i'll be damned it probably was the best tequila i'd ever had you know it was, tasted yeah, like man. drinking melted vanilla beans or something you know um wow. you know anyways he's just uh you have to like and he's so funny you know he has so many funny stories so he just mm. uh he was talking about on the nice guys like ryan gosling like would uh you know tell all these jokes and you, you just see his appreciation for other great humor and other funny things and you're like man he just loves life and yeah you know as one of those types of people he's not a know-it-all or anything like that he just is a true renaissance man who like loves all aspects of life and wants to know things about everything you know and i think that's why he's such a good horseman it's why he's you know, was, you know, his, he talks about like the sword fighting aspects of things like gladiator and stuff like that. And um, he talks about it being like a dance and you just realize like, yeah, Russell truly is just a, a student of life who just loves to drink it all in. Class act, class yeah. act. Yeah, for sure. Nice. All right. Um, the action then. So he talked about a, a relatively tight budget. Um I, I think I think he managed to do quite a lot with it. Yeah, there. like just to show you how tight it is, the guy, the voice at the end of the movie, and the guy flying the plane at the very end, and the that's me just wearing a helmet. Um, like Gunner, my friend Gunner, who's in you know my previous movies, he's the main star of Love. He he has a part in the movie where he's a drone pilot, but he's also the guy in the back of the jet who comes in on the F eighteen which we shot in a real jet. My friend had a guy, he just owned like an Albatross jet, the same jets they use for Top Gun. And wow. he just, I think he lives over in the UK somewhere. But yeah, he was like, I'll be in town and I'll have my jet. If you guys want to shoot in the back of it, I'll take somebody up. And so we we went up and just shot the heck out of this jet for like two days. Wow. And uh, yeah, we got very lucky with a lot of small like mm. things like that but yeah it's tricky you know like on a small budget just trying to trying to maximize you're always also just trying to like really pile up the money in particular places like that mm. night sequence um where all the explosions are going on it's very orange you know that that lighting setup was like three hundred thousand dollars wow and everyone was fighting it all the producers were like we can't do this we can't there's no way like 
it's just too expensive for this. And we fought tooth and nail to make it happen because I just knew it's like on a smaller budget, you need those big moments at yeah. least. And, you know, being able to bring the helicopter down in and have the helicopter lit by those lights and then have the mm. lights explode as the explosions are going to make them bigger. I would just trust me. I was like, this will be all over the trailer. It's worth every penny. Um, so they've, you know, we finally got that through and, you know, that's just a big part of it is just trying to make sure you spend the money in the right places, the places that will make the trailer and, you know, visually look impressive. And cause we were copying the lighting setup from, uh, the Deacons movie, the end of, uh, it's where Javier Bardem is trying to shoot the, is it Casino Royale? Is that it? Where they, Javier uh, Bardem is like shooting at. They they go to the house and then the house gets blown up. Ah, uh, no, that's um. Oh, I know. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I, I or is that Quantum of was. Solace? Anyway, no, it was the one after that. God, I okay, don't know. Casino Royale or yeah, I whichever one yeah, it is. Shot by Deacons it looks incredible. <laughs> and yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, we showed him the lighting setup for that. The bank of like maxi brutes, and there was like a hundred <laughs> maxi brutes stacked, and they were like, we're, we're not doing this. <laughs> but we cut budget in other places and we finally got the money to do it there was so much power running to those maxi brutes on the far side of that thing that when we buried the cables like a foot underground and when you'd stand on that part of the ground you would just everything was vibrating you'd just be like wow. just super yeah. power yeah i mean you it, i mean you say about having a fight for that scene but it's a great scene like the oh, lighting's great you. it it adds it's just a visceral moment, isn't it? And it's not what you expect in... Again, it's adding more legitimacy to, you know, a, a mid-tier film. Like, it's yeah. adding more more legitimacy where, you know, you take it a bit more seriously, a bit more credibility. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it goes a long way. Those, those things, it's that, that level of, of attention to detail that matters. Because you, you could flippantly be like, ah, yeah, whatever, it doesn't really matter, and shoot something else. But, uh, yeah, the end product's not going to be the same. It's not going to... Right. Yeah, it's just not remotely going to be the same. Um, there was a surprising amount of gore in this. I was not expecting. Yeah. Um, yeah. The no no spoilers, but I wasn't expecting what happened to a certain individual. Um, oh, okay. Of, of yeah. the female variety. Yeah, it's very very crazy. You know, I say that with with as little spoilers as possible. <laughs> yeah, it's just you want people to. You know, I look. We knew it was going to be rated R at the last minute, but no, no. <laughs> What's that? I said I was expecting one of them to shoot at the last. Yeah, minute. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Exactly. It's yeah. tough. I mean, look. There's a lot of crazy things. <clears throat> like I, yeah, yeah. It's funny. It's funny. My wife is the one who's always telling me. She's like, William, you gotta, you know, the kids. They want something crazier. And uh, my wife, you know, even on like next of kin you know is a paranormal activity is like you know even it's i'm not even i was trying to be a little crazy with that but it's not that crazy i guess and you're like you look at movies like uh fede alvarez is doing with um evil dead and stuff mm. and you're like okay he goes crazy and yeah, you, you so. start to realize like even like you know, anything Sam Raimi was doing, you're like, man, he goes crazy, you know? And you're like, yeah. okay, I'm doing a war movie about crazy things happening. Obviously, I'm not going to make it like, I'm not doing what they're doing. They're doing like kind of gross, crazy things that are very triggery. But in some yeah. ways, I was like, okay, I really need to at least get enough. Like, it was funny because my manager called me. And was like, I really think you should cut out that one intense part at the near the whatever. And yeah. she's like, or just cut away. You know, you should cut away. And it's yeah, like man. my wife yeah. was like, no, you can't. You just got to go crazy because it's part of the identity of like, let's say the bad guy. And you kind of have to feel that, especially in a film where we primarily stick, in my opinion, with the good guys. Or mm. with you know with the protagonist, you don't get a ton of time to build who the bad guy is, yeah. and so you want to maximize mm. your feelings towards him in the time that you have. Um, 
But I also think like it, it provides a, a, a wealth of legitimacy for for you your, your characters to do what they do. And ultimately, it's a cop out doing a cutaway. You know, too many films yeah. do cutaways. Too many films go, you know, sort of blink and you miss it type thing. And, and yeah. it's it, it's too much of a cop out. Like it, it's good. It's not it's not shock factor for shock factor's sake. Like it serves the story because yeah, there's again, as you say, you spend a great deal of time with the good guys and their journey you need to know what they're up against. Yeah. So in that moment, you know they're up against someone that is ruthless, merciless, absolutely, you know, ha has a world of conviction behind what they're doing and will stop at nothing. They don't care. You know, it's super yeah. important. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I, I hope I, you know, because I've been seeing a lot of people saying, whoa, this film is brutal. <laughs> and I never think of myself... Of anybody, I'm always like, I'm not a brutal filmmaker. I'm a sometimes emotionally, I'm a sissy. I'm like, ooh, that's too much, or ooh, that's crazy. Somehow on this one, I I guess I had always planned it long enough that I kind of was like dead to it in a way because you've Thank seen it so many times. You're over, you're going over it. You try to shoot it in a way that like isn't too. For instance, we had obviously the child on set, so I was always like concerned mm. with like, oh, I don't want this to be. You know, I don't, I just don't want to scar this poor kid. Like, you know, so we were always like, and then the kid was like, whoa, that's so cool. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's like, <laughs> I was like, to the parents, I was like, no, no, let's, he's got to go over there when we shoot this, you know, like this is, and they're like, no, he yeah. loves it. It's so, you know, and I'm like, no, 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 no. You guys go over there. We're going to shoot this and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I'm, I'm a, yeah, I'm a dad, you know, and I've got another baby yeah. on the way. So I'm like, you know, yeah, it's just it's funny, but I'm glad that it's effective, you know. And I I don't mm. think we did. I think we I think we hit a sweet spot with it where we're not too gratuitous or anything like that, but you get just enough to be people saying, "Oh, this is brutal," which some yeah, people like, I, brutal, you know. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think it was gratuitous at all. Quite frankly, cool. I think like I think it serves a purpose. It the thing is, it was just surprising, not in a gratuitous fashion, just because. You don't normally see it because yeah. they normally do the cop out route. Right. It's normally yeah. just a quick cutaway. It's normally that sort of thing. So it was quite refreshing to actually sounds sounds weird. It was quite refreshing to see that. Um, <laughs> no, I know what you're saying. You know what I mean, yeah. right? Like maybe also because we're an independent film, like completely independent in that regard. We, you know, had it been a studio, we probably would have done the cut around. Um, mm -hmm. That that I'm sure would have come down the pipe from somebody but because we just yeah. in fact we did not test this film which also makes me not? feel really good because right now we have like a 93 percent on uh, audience rating on rotten tomatoes and we didn't test the film there was not one test so this is truly just my film you know and i was like wow we're not gonna test this you guys i'm very used to that process now it's like taking your medicine and you test mm. it for all these people and they tear it apart and try to fix it mm. you know you're because you're making a film for audience people you're you're in the business of making films for people but they were like no nah, yeah, we're not gonna yeah. test it we're just gonna release it <laughs> i was like okay that's, what you're doing. that's really really good yeah so now that we have a 93 i'm like maybe i'll just fight to never have my stuff tested Tre <laughs> just trust me guys i'm the director <laughs> i know what's right <laughs> check out my last rating on rotten tomatoes <laughs> Yeah, I doubt they're gonna. Uh, yeah, this. How um? So the fact that it is in theaters, really, really good get. I'm, you know, congratulations for getting it in theaters because obviously, the type of movie it is in terms of how it got made and things like that for it to be released. Can you can you talk about that process at all? Like how how it ended up being put in theaters? Who's doing that? How long it's going to be in theaters for yeah. anyone that you know, actually sure maybe hasn't seen it? Yeah, and wants to go and see it. Um, so very lucky we got in theaters. It's honestly without a studio behind it. Like we, I, we had had some offers where, where people would buy the film, like some studios or mini studios had offered to buy the film. And, um, it wasn't for very much and it wasn't really enough for how much, um, our, our main company Highland had put in and it'd been mm. pre-sold. So there really wasn't that much money against the film. There's like, 
you know, very little money really against the film to make up when you take into account, like if you can put it into theaters for a second and then you can go to streaming and, you know, it's possible to be made whole, if not make some money. So the offers that they got from the mini studios wasn't quite enough. Now, the one thing is, had it gone to a mini studio, we'd have real PNA. Like our PNA was, I'll just say it, $340,000, which is so, like when I figured that, I was like, oh no, we're dead in the water. Because we went to a thousand theaters, which is a third of a wide, ultra, ultra wide's like 3,500 theaters. Yeah. Wide's 2,500. And so we're, you know, we're a thousand theaters. And the only reason we probably got those theaters is because there's no movies in theaters right now. So we were very lucky for theaters to let us go in. And a, this is not a movie that's good for theaters right now. This is yeah. The thing. Yeah. I mean, it's really tricky. The I'll just be totally frank about it. If you're a theater owner, I don't know how much they know how much somebody's going to put into PA, but you really want to have theater movies in your theater that there's a big production company putting into mm. PA. And that's why they do have good relationships with studios because the studio, if your movie's 15 million, they're going to put 15 million or at least 10 into PA. Mm. So this was kind of crazy where, you know, there's very little into PA. I mean, minis like that's non existent. Um, yeah. You know, I, I don't know. I was like, okay, guys, that's crazy. So there wasn't really any risk on their part because they didn't have to put that much into PA. And then the theaters were just fortunately hurting for films right now because of all the strikes. So we did get in. And because I think the film's not too bad, um, hopefully, or people seem to be enjoying it, it started to do decently. And now, fortunately, that's kicked a little more towards PA because we we made some money so they're like oh gosh let's spend a little bit now um not much i think it's like another half a million or something that's, going that's into good, week right? two but the other cool thing is we're in for a traditional release so i believe we'll be in theaters for it's not like a vod release where you're only in theaters for two weeks or something we're going to be in mm. theaters for a month um oh, okay yeah. so pretty cool obviously as soon as dune hits not this weekend, but next weekend, everything's going to drop off. Um, maybe we'll get some, like, you know, people who can't get into Dune or something and they have to pick a different movie. But, yeah. um, well, I mean, I, I would argue that, you know, Dune getting people into theaters will, will spark their interest of seeing other films potentially anyway. You know, you see another film advertised, you're going to be like, oh, what's that? You know, make, you know, yeah, I, I'm true. In, I enjoyed true. this experience. Maybe I'll go back in another day and see another film because I enjoyed this experience. That's yeah. the thing. People have been out of theaters for so long because there's been literally nothing worthwhile going to go and watch. They forget that the movie going experience is enjoyable. Like it's a, yeah. it's a good time. You know, it's a good thing to go and do. So if you go there, you have a good time again. You want to yeah. go back and what's playing? Well, be Land of Bad as well. Sure. True. True. We, um, my, sound guy wayne lamar we mix the movie on a decent stage out in australia um and i i we flew to wayne's from here in la but we flew to to uh australia and wayne is like such an amazing mixer like he he's wes anderson's personal guy wes will fly him oh. to the uk to do all of his mixes for all of their stuff so i'm very fortunate to have met and wayne is responsible for underwater and Wayne's mm. just such a sweet guy. And my mom owns like Newfoundland dogs and Wayne owns Newfoundland dogs. So he like follows my mom on Instagram and knows all about her and stuff. And so we've stayed not because of my mom, but I feel like a little bit because of my mom. Wayne has like a soft spot for me and my small films. So like Wayne has always helped us out and like does such an amazing job. But because of that, to me, one of the biggest parts of the theatrical experience is the sound and how it's mixed and where everything is and the mm. detail and, you know, really feeling the explosions. And Wayne was doing so much cool stuff with the explosions to make you like really feel them and really give things the proper theatrical, you know, experience. And we knew maybe the film isn't even released to that many theaters, but Wayne's the type of guy when he's working, he can't, help but like make it theatrical and so That's i knew going into this it would be if we did get into theaters 
uh, people would enjoy that, you know, mm. crazy explosion experience. So, yeah, but that is good though. Like you, again, that's you taking your film seriously. Yeah, that's yeah. what you want to hear from someone. That's what you want to hear from someone that wrote and you know wrote and directed the film. You don't want to hear them again. Like, well, you know, we didn't know it was going to go to theaters, so we just got any sound guy to do it. Yeah, like, oh, oh no way. Go, yeah, can't yeah, do it. Like, yeah, like we we didn't know, but we we you know gave it a good a good bloody try to make sure it would be good if you know if there was any potential and regardless it's still yeah. going to sound good anyway like that's what you want you don't want yeah it's, it's someone having some confidence in their film i guess yeah and some care yeah. and attention over it and i don't know i love like my editor todd talk about brutal stuff he cut all the purges so he's like he's a pretty crazy yeah. guy uh but he comes from such a cool background like Todd Miller like worked on like Con Air and The Rock and has done a lot of work for Michael Bay and you know he's we're very different filmmakers but I think the two of us we kind of like meet in the middle on a lot of things and it makes for a unique combo but having Wayne Todd and myself mixing the film in Australia um kind of away from home and just focusing on the theatrical experience of it yeah. um it was so much fun like you get to a point where you're just giggling about stuff and you're like, you're making the sound effects. And we were, we were flying in a lot of sound effects hot while we were mixing, which is not normal. Like normally you're, you know, you're, it's all, you know, it's all like mixed already. And you're kind of there by yourself. Mm -hmm. Like for instance, I'm pretty sure Wayne was like, he had just come from working on Borderlands and you know, he the, then comes to a much smaller film and now he's working on this and, but I feel like part of the experience is like making films with your buddies, you know, and like, mm. you know, you get me, Todd and Wayne and we're all like, you get like tickled by certain sound effects or certain fun things. And you're like, oh, that's amazing. Yes. You know, and the craft becomes so enjoyable and like so much mm. of like, you're like, ah, this is why I love making movies. Just enjoying doing this fun stuff with my buddies, you know, and then at night but, we'd uh, like we'd kind of be tourists in Australia. We'd go down to like check out the Sydney opera house and have a glass of wine or something. And yeah, we were like, all right, we're not getting paid anything really, but we're having a blast, you know? So it was an experience, isn't it? And that, that's the thing, right? Like films. Yeah. It, it, it's you, you, a lot of films have lost their soul now anyway, because they're made for committee yeah, you know, for an audience just to try and, and they're not pleasing people either. Um, I would argue that, you know, if you do go and watch this film, ladies and gents, uh, you will enjoy this film. And I think it speaks volumes to hearing the story behind it and how, how it's been made. Um, you know, the very clear differences. You know, this is yeah, it was a, a thoroughly enjoyable film. So it's nice to hear that you guys had fun making it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sort of putting it all together. Quite it frankly. takes so long. You know, you're like you're on a movie for like two years or something. And, and uh, it's a bit of a marathon. And so, I, you know, Another editor of mine, Brian Burdan, he did a bunch of David Lynch stuff. He cut love. He cut the signal. He always told me, remember, William, this is your life. And every job you take takes years of it. And so he's like, just do what you love. Just do make characters you love, make scenes that you love. Like, just enjoy it because you're going to be stuck in this for a while. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it was yeah, always stage days. advice, you know. Yeah, uh, I like still try to. The worst, take the worst thing you can do is hate what you're up to. I mean, especially oh, if it's so yeah. long. Yeah. So how how long was the shoot then? How like from start? To Pretty good for such a small budget. Um, we we got we were able to get 42 days. It was supposed to be 45, but wow. I probably because that lighting setup, we went down to 42. <laughs> mm. um, that's but that's pretty good for a small film. We were about like 14 million in USD. Uh, mm. But we were shooting in Australia, so the 14 million goes a lot further because 66 yeah. cents on the dollar at the time. So, yeah, okay, well. Um, but it was helpful because Russell was there and Liam was there. And uh, so there were some other, you know, benefits to, you know, mm. being, being in uh, Australia. And the jungles yeah. are just so impressive there. It's like, God, the trees and. You don't think of Australia like that. You're always thinking like the outback, you know, but it's so jungly as you get up north. Where, where was it you were filming for that then? That, that Gold Coast, so just under Brisbane. 
Right. And which is good because anything over Brisbane starts to have crocodiles in the water. Anything under Brisbane, no crocodiles in the water, which is just good to know, you know. Um, but it's really interesting because the the jungle start like breaking up, um, and you'll just be like on a ranch, like a cattle rancher's, you know, giant ranch, and he'll he'll drive over in his little buggy thing, and he'll be like, "Yeah, follow me," and he'll just like take you to this crack in his ground. In a little canyon, you'll be like, there's jungle down in there. And you'd be like, really? Like, there's <laughs> jungle here? And you go down in and it's like, boom, you're just transported to Southeast Asia. I was like, oh wow. my God, just these incredible trees. And yeah. Mm. So obviously, as you go north, that jungle becomes like everything. But yeah, there's yeah. little pockets as you go south. So yeah. So where, where did you film the Russell Crowe? stuff where was that then that was all shot at a racetrack um in the gold coast because disney was took up every studio everything you could not find a studio so much to a point where we were like i remember at one point we were in an old kfc and they were like can we build the sets in here and i was like guys what are you talking about <laughs> like these are like tunnels like there's no space in here you know <laughs> Uh, we ended up finding an event space underneath the bleachers of a big racetrack in uh, Queensland, in, in the Gold Coast. And they were willing to let us shoot there and build sets, which mm. was kind of impressive. But um, the only catch was we couldn't shoot. There was like one or two days that they had a huge, like all of Australia stops to watch their Kentucky Derby. So... Mm. The catch was we had to not be in there on those days. So we had to like not, right, sh we yeah. shot something in some water somewhere, but yeah, oh. built the jungle sets or sorry, excuse me, built the tunnel sets and we built the um, drone sets there. Nice. Wow. So pretty cool. Yeah. You did, yeah. Well, you, yeah, you did a hell of a lot with the, the budget and the locations then. Yeah. Like, had a great, uh, a good place. you can do so much with the, with, with the, the sort of, geographical you know topography the, the differences yeah. i guess how, yeah whatever you want to call it you do a lot with that clearly very very clearly yeah it's a lot right, of so if um uh, I, I i guess uh if anyone was watching and you still haven't watched it and you still don't want to watch it um will sell sell your movie i'm just going to get you to sell your film now <laughs> i would just say if you enjoy uh you know uh, first off, if you enjoy any of R Russell's recent movies where he's a little bit more of a character actor and you like to see him just having fun, you know, with the characters he's playing, I, this is definitely one of those movies where I, I feel like I've captured, I don't know, I feel very proud to like have one of these versions of Russell where he's playing, he's a little he's just kind of confident with his humor and like, you just feel like you're getting a lighter side of Russell. And I'm, I'm proud to have one of those movies where I have like sassy, funny Russell. Like it just makes me, and he's incredibly in some ways he's very heartwarming and some of those heartwarming ideas were really his. So you're really getting to see a window into real Russell because he created some of this heartwarming, hopeful, stuff that i just wasn't expecting and i it wasn't written he made it so i'm like it's really fun to see that and to get a window into his creative mind um and aside from it obviously if you like action and, and crazy bombastic you know a little bit old school stuff then you know there's a lot of that too so and milo ventimiglia and ricky whittle they both play such awesome operators and you know, the, mm. the stuff that both of those guys do is just incredible. Um, fun to see Milo just coming in with such a, like, hardcore ghost recon character. But I just, I, yeah, proud that I have his movie that he does that too. So there's just a lot that I, I'm, like, stoked as in my movie. Like, you just feel like, ah, this is cool. So so, so there you go. You must watch the film. It's very, very good. I had a good time with it. You will too, I'm sure. What is, if you can say, because I don't know, you, you might not be able to, but what's next for Mr. Eubank? It's honestly a good question. Uh, we will see. I'm not totally certain. There's a movie that um, I might do 
uh, called The Epiphany, which is out in Philadelphia with Sylvester Stallone, that they they offered me uh, that job, which is it's pretty cool. It's a very seven, very different type of thing. It's a drama detective mm -hmm. movie, very seven-ish, um, cool script. Very different again. So I would be, hopefully maybe I do that movie. We'll see. And uh, again, it'll be kind of a new type of thing for me. Um, this is very different from other stuff that I've done, but hopefully I can bring kind of the things I love from like Fincher movies and stuff like that and put some of that in there. If I do that, um, if I don't do that, I have another project that we're going to slowly start casting called blue fly, which is, a uh, film I wrote again with this writer and my brother. So the team okay. from the signal, um, that is a, that is my version of like heart of darkness where they're traveling up a river essentially. And you realize like Kurt, it's, it's, it's about a group of military people going to retrieve a down prototype aircraft. And, mm. um, you realize that like, Kurtz is with them on the boat and he's maybe not human. So it's a very strange sci-fi bendery type film, but um, it's really, it's pretty cool. And it really gets into some of the cool craziness that is going on in the Congo today with, you know, mm. like the pirate, the pirate, you know, oil refineries and shell oil and not specifically shell, but just like all yeah. the crazy stuff that's truly going on in the Congo that is wild. Uh, yeah. not, not nothing political, just really looks at it. Just sort of, you get yeah. to see it, you know, and it's pretty yeah. interesting. So, Any, but again, uh, that's just an action sci-fi. So maybe, maybe a bit Lovecraftian in there. Maybe. Very, very, yeah. Some cool shit. <laughs> uh, and it, it has, it has a theme of time, which, yeah, I just, okay. I'm going to make that pretty fun. I think like really this movie, the main character She's very like uh, she's very like Sicario esque, where yeah, she's thrown yeah. into something that she thinks she's there just to be a translator, and then she realizes like, whoa, what is happening? Like, what's going on? Bro. And um, she's just all about time, like always. Just it's just part of her nature to be like controlled by this like idea of of like being regulated, and you know. Uh, it's very interesting but you know me i love slow-mo so there's gonna be i've done some creative things with how this all works with time but anyways i do i do i do like your the signature slow-mo <laughs> I, I, I know i've been thinking about if i do do this epiphany film which is totally like a drama a dark drama you know i'm like Dang. you can have you can have a slow-mo slice the lane drink in a cup cup of coffee yeah something i'm like where do i put the slow-mo in this i'm i haven't figured it out car, <laughs> pulling away in a vehicle <laughs> taking the groceries out of the vehicle you know just, just yeah. <laughs> yeah totally anyways oh dear, oh dear right well thank you uh for joining me do appreciate it and absolutely um, really appreciate you uh having me on and thank you for no, I do appreciate it. always always a pleasure always a pleasure and again, yeah. ladies and gents, please, yeah, go check it out. Uh, at least go check the trailer out, Land of Bad. I'll leave it linked down below. Um, but it's good. I enjoyed it. So I awesome. hope you enjoyed the interview. And uh, thank you, Will, for joining me once again. Cheers. Thank you.